There we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, for those who are on Instagram, bring it to you Bible study a little bit, a uh, little uh, live, live today, obviously, but um, a little earlier, put it that way, normally at seven. We are starting it right now at six. Um, so I felt like we need that Bible study. And um, so this is good, of course. Um, those on YouTube, we welcome you as well and, and everyone else. Um, this is our last week of uh, studying the book of Isaiah. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 10 tonight. Um, and this is the last week that we'll be looking um, at Isaiah. We're going to take a pause on Isaiah and get ready uh, since we're about to be in November. It's crazy to believe this year has gone by. This crazy year has gone by so quick. Um, but we are about to be in uh, 2021. And so um, November 4th, we're going to start a new Bible, st another Bible study series that uh, will bring us into 2021. Get us ready. Get us geared up. Get us grinding. All right, for 2021, uh, get us a little excited because I know a lot of us, for a lot of us, 2020 has been hell um, and so uh, and crazy. And so uh, we are all ready for 2021. And so we're going to try to um, do this uh, Bible study series from November 4th until every Wednesday at 7 p.m., starting November 4th. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take that all the way up until. Uh, the uh, last Wednesday in December, we're going to start off fresh in January. So super excited. And then we'll pick, pick back up the uh, our Isaiah Bible study series later next year. Um, so super excited about this and what God is playing and what God is doing um, for us. Uh, let us pray. Father God of grace, mercy, and love, we thank you, God, for this wonderful day that you have given us, God. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and love that woke us up this morning and started us on our way, God. But some of us today has been crazy. And so, God, right now, we ask that you will open our hearts, open our ears for what it is that you need us to learn and hear tonight, God. Use us, God. Use me, God. Hide me behind your cross right now, oh God. It is in your son Jesus' name we ask all these things and we pray. Amen. Again, I'm glad that you guys are with me and watching all that good stuff. So again, this week we're going to cover chapter 10. We're going to go okay, cover the whole chapter 10. Uh, and tonight what I wanted to do is focus on strong faith. Strong faith. Strong faith. Um, so here in chapter 10 of Isaiah, right, Isaiah continues to discuss the judgment uh, that would take place un under the wrath of God because of the nation's cruelty and their jealous um, and injustice ways towards the poor, um, specifically in this text, um, that these first few verses focus on in this chapter, uh, which is the oppression of the poor. The poor. And when I was reading this chapter, I thought how much this is, how much this relates. Uh, so how so much this relates to today and what we're going through and how we have a lot of leaders who say they're going to do this, say they're going to do that, and they oppress the poor. Um, and so the Bible doesn't teach us to oppress the poor, but to help the poor, right? And so that's what Jesus teaches us. But this is what this uh, this this chapter focuses on. And look at verse one here. We're going to read verses one um, through four right now. So verses one through four of, of chapter 10. Isaiah speaks, he says, what sorrow awaits the unjust judges and those who issue unfair laws? They derive, deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of the needy among the people. They prey on widows and take advantage of orphans. What will you do when I punish you? When I send disaster upon you from a distant land, to whom will you turn for help? Where will you treasure be safe? You will stumble along as prisoners or lie among the dead, but even when the Lord's anger will not, even the Lord's anger will not be satisfied, but, but his fist, I'm sorry, is still poised to strike. And so Isaiah discusses here how unjust the judges were at that time. He discusses how the very ones who seem to hold power in the land where their main uh, one, where the main ones oppressing the poor, and foretells how they will be oppressed themselves because of the conditions they put the poor in. They are now going to get a little taste of their own medicine. 
They had to learn to be accountable for their actions and what they did to the poor, for preying on widows and taking advantage of the poor and denying the rights of the needy is what they were doing. This is not right. This is not who they should be doing, what they should be doing as leaders, right? And so it just, it just wasn't right. And so they had to be called out and punished before God. And God teaches us in this text that to love the poor, not to oppress them or treat them as if they're garbage and as if they're nothing. No, that's not who we are as children of God. That's not who, what, what we're supposed to do. We have to uplift them. We have to encourage them and help those who cannot help those themselves. We have to be a voice for the voiceless. Right? And Jesus taught us to love one another, not no matter if you're rich or poor. As people of God, we must take care of those and treat each other with love and, uh, and uplift one another, not push or hold each other down. And this is exactly what they were doing. These are leaders, and they're yet oppressing the poor and holding them down. This is not what we're supposed to do. And so the judges were oppressing the poor and holding them down. So Isaiah foretells of the disaster that would come and their punishment that they would experience because of this. No matter if they would try to escape and, and go back and, and seek help from among those false prophets and those false gods that they worshiped, they weren't going to help them do this. They weren't going to be the ones that get them out of this. No, because they failed to worship the true and living God. It would not work. And so, therefore, no judgment against God would work, even if they went that in that direction. They were not acting as real leaders and being the voice of the voice voiceless. They were simply oppressing the poor, and so God needed to teach them a lesson. These same God you put your hope and your trust in, they will not stand up against me, God's wrath, God's judgment. This is what God tells them, right? So look at verses 5 through 7. Let's read verses 5 through 7. And this is when judgment, this is when Isaiah starts to picture the judgment against the Assyrian army. He says this, what sorrow awaits Syria, the rod of my anger? I use it as a club to express my anger. I am sending Assyria against a godless nation, against a people with whom I am angry. Syria will plunder them, trampling them like dirt beneath its feet. But the king of Assyria will not understand that he is my tool. His mind does not work that way. His plan is simply to destroy, to cut the nation after nation, he will say, each of my princes will soon be a king. Stop right there. So here at this time in Isaiah, right? Isaiah's ministry, Isaiah, in, 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 during Isaiah's ministry, Assyria was a dominant power in the world. They were a dominant uh, army, right? They were, they were powerful. Like they had all the arsenals. They had everything you can imagine. They could defeat any and everybody. I can only imagine the people in the, the, the guys in the army were probably strong, tough, big, built and everything, right? And so they were a dominant superpower at this time due to in part because of their aggressiveness, right? And their tendency, their aggressive tendencies in war. And so there is sorrow that awaits Assyria. First, they didn't even know or realize that they were actually a part of God's plan. Here they are thinking that they're going in to destroy this land on their own, but this was actually God that was sending them. And this was a part of God's plan from the beginning, right? So they didn't even know this. They didn't even realize that this was God's plan and how God was going to strike Israel. Even though they rejected God, these Assyrians, even though they rejected God, he still used them to judge his own people. Wow. God used his enemy, the, the people who, who, who didn't like him, as a target for his own people. Interesting here. And I'm going to tell you why. Isaiah saw that. Assyrian nation was nothing more than a rod 
that would be used to cast judgment on his own people. God would use these very people who rejected him and did not believe in him to show them a lesson. He showed their people, his people a lesson. What this teaches us in this text is that because we serve a sovereign God who works through history, we have to abide by his will. That's just the reality. Simply to refuse God's will for our lives and, and not take all of what he's saying and to simply reject God and his plans for our lives, will, God will use the very enemy against us to come into our lives and destroy and cause a ruckus over our situations and everything we so desperately work towards. And this is why you have to be careful. It is the wrath of God's judgment. You can't reject God. You can't run from God. God has blessed them with this land, but yet they rejected God. So God needed to teach them a lesson. When we oppose God and we reject him, when we oppress the poor and take advantage of our neighbors, when we worship false idols, we cause our own enemies to be the instruments that God would use to hurt us. This is powerful. So look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. He says, we destroyed Kalno just as we did Karshemish. Hamath fell up before us as Arpit did, and we destroyed Samaria, Samaria just as we did Damascus. Yes, we have finished off many a kingdom whose gods were greater than those in Jerusalem and Samaria. Check this out. Stop there. Assyria uh, was this nation that was destroyed. Uh, that destroyed other nations. Again, they were powerful, they were big, they were, they were tough, right? And, and, and they destroyed other nations like Cano and Carmish and Samaria and Damascus. And they believed that Judah would be no different. They knew that they were going to conquer this land, right? On their own. But here's the difference. They thought that they were going to be the enemy that would defeat this land and be and they weren't going to be the ones that, that were going to be defeated in battle. But they did not know that they were under the hand of God. That's what they didn't know. They didn't realize that God was in control of everything that, we, that they would be doing. God placed them where they are. It's not them that placed them there themselves, but it is God that actually, in fact, placed them there, right? Look at verse 12. verse 12. So verse 11, I'm sorry. So we will defeat Jerusalem and her dog, her gods, I'm sorry, just as we destroyed Samaria with hers. After the Lord had used the king of Assyria to accomplish his purpose on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, he will turn against the king of Assyria and punish him for he is proud and arrogant. He boasts by his own powerful arm. I have done this with my own shrewd wisdom. I planned it. I have broken down the defenses of nations and carried off their treasures. I have knocked down their kings like a bull. I have robbed their nest of riches and gathered up kingdoms as, far as a farmer gathers eggs. No one can even flip a wing against me or utter a peep of protest. Stop there. The Assyrians were so proud, especially the king. He was so proud of himself, so arrogant. He was so cocky with it. Felt like he did this on his own, right? It wasn't God that put him here. God wasn't God that gave him the tools that he needed in battle to defeat, right? And so the Assyrians was proud, were arrogant for reasons because they had victorious wins, right? They had victorious reasons. So they had a reason to be proud. They had a reason to be arrogant and cocky, right? But God placed them here. That's what they missed. God permitted them to win. God permitted their victories. And they thought that they had accomplished everything in their own power. But because they rejected God and refused to acknowledge him, they were too stupid to realize that it was God that placed them where they are at this very moment. It was too stupid to realize that they were being used by God. And so Israel predicted, punish, Isaiah, I'm sorry, predicted punishment of the Assyrians that would take place in 701 BC when 185,000 Assyrians 
soldiers were slain by the angel of the Lord. So later the Assyrian empire fell to Babylon and never rose again. Uh, they were bound to fail from the beginning because of their rejection of God. Look at verse, um, let's go to verse, let's go to verse uh, 15. It says, but can the ax boast greater power than the person who uses it? <laughs> Stick with me here. Stick with me here. Let me read that again. Can the ax boast greater power than the person who uses it? Is the saw greater than the person who saws? Can a wooden cane walk by itself? Therefore, verse 16. The Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies will send a plague again amongst Assyria's proud troops and a flaming fire will consume its glory. The Lord, the light of Israel will be, will be a fire. The Holy One will be a flame. He will devour the thorns and briars with fire, burning up the enemy in a single night. The Lord will consume Assyria's glory like a fire consume a forest and a fruitful land. It will waste away like sick people in a plague of all that gl uh, glorious forest only a few trees will survive so few that a child can count them check this out look at verse 15 again can they ask boast greater power than the person who uses it? Is the saw greater than the person who saws? Can a rod strike unless a hand moves it? Can a wooden cane walk by itself? God is in control. God is in control. No tool is more powerful than the master who builds it, who, who uses it to build, right? Uh, the Assyrians were more, they thought that they were more powerful than God. They thought that they had everything in control. They thought that they, they could win this battle on their own. They thought that they had every tool necessary to, to use it to, to win this battle. In fact, they were the very tools that God was using against his own people. They weren't greater than God. A hammer, in order for a nail to go into, if you're building a table and in order for a nail to go into uh, that table, it has to have a hammer. And that hammer has a hand that moves it, that uses it, right? And so this is what God was. God was the person. He was the builder. He was the, the, the person that was forcing, he was the, the, the person that was forcing the hand among them. God was the one that was using them. Without God, they were nothing. If a hammer doesn't have the person beating it against the nail to the table, it can't do anything. They can't do anything without God. They are powerless without God. They boasted in their accomplishments and thought that they had all the power. The lesson here is that God has given us all gifts and talents. He has. He has given us all resources for our lives in battle, but it is important to realize and recognize that it is not us who have done it ourselves, but we receive it from God. God is the one who has given us this power, not us ourselves, but we work through God. Verse 20 and 21. Verse 20 and 21 says, and here's the hope. Here's the hope for this, for the people. In that day, the remnant left in Israel, the survivors in the house of Jacob will no longer depend on allies who seek to destroy them. But they will faithfully trust the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return. Yes, the remnant of Jacob will return to the mighty God. But the but though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant of them will return. The Lord has rightly decided to destroy his people. Yes, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies has already decided to destroy the entire land. Check this out. Once Assyria's army had been destroyed, the people got got to their senses, came to their senses. And as a small group, as the text says, of God's people would stop, rely, stop relying on Assyria and they started relying on God. 
they started trusting in God. They started believing in God. At one point, a couple chapters ago, we read, they rejected God. Now they're starting to come to their senses. They're coming to their realization that they need God in their lives, and they can't do this without God. It was only God that was going to get them through their t- trials and their tribulations. It was only God that was going to get them through this dark time. It was only God that was going to get them through this battle. And so this remnant that would be spared was only a fraction of Israel's population. And that's a reference back to in the uh, book of Ezra, chapter 2, uh, verse 64 and 65, that returned to Judah when it says, so a total of 42,360 people returned to Judah in addition to 7,337 servants and 200 singers, both men and women. The remnant refers to those who were faithful, strong faith folks, to God despite the destruction that took place in their land. In spite of how powerful the Assyrian army's army is, not to get, get discouraged, not to get overwhelmed, not to get get to 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 to, to uh, get in, a, anxious, but to remember to have strong faith and stand firm with God. The key for the people uh, to be a part of the remnant and the lesson in this was strong faith. Just being descendants of Abraham was not good enough for the people. The people had to prove that they were faithful and still holding to their trust in God in spite of destruction and in spite of the judgment from God that took place in their land. They had to prove through their faith. They had to go through this even after God already warned them of the destruction that was about to take place. These are the people that would actually repent and receive the benefits of God's promise because of their faith. We go through trials and tribulations and I get it, life is hard. It's not enough to just go to church. It's not enough to just read the Bible. You have to actually activate it. Put your faith into motion. Make it, make it, make it so it's believable. Show God as an active figure in your life through the life's toughest trials and tribulations that you go through. It's an act of faith, strong faith. This was the test for the people. Those who did not return in the remnant was the ones that were destroyed by the judgment of God because of their lack of faith and obedience to God. Because they didn't want to be faithful to God. Because they wanted to not trust God would get them through this because they did not believe that God would be there for them. Because they wanted to be, oh, continue to oppress the poor and, and believe in the false idols and all those things, not trust God. Now they find themselves destroyed and feeling the wrath of God's judgment because of that lack of faith. In life, we have to realize that in the midst of destruction, we still have to put our faith in God. And that he will get us through. I get it. Sometimes it's hard to see that. But that's what strong faith does. Despite what it looks like and despite the challenges, we have to not reject God, but be faithful to him. And that he will see us through and save us from those times of destruction. Look at verse 24. Again, God warned them of what was happening. This is what happened in verse 24. So this is what the Lord, the Lord heaven army says. Oh, my people in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians when they oppress you with rod and clubs as the Egyptians did long ago. In a little while, in a little while, in a little while, my anger against you will end. And then my anger will rise up to destroy them, the very people that God used to destroy them. God was only doing this to encourage them and push his people, but 
he's going to use the tool that he used to destroy, try to destroy them, to then to turn it back on the tool and destroy the tool. That's powerful, folks. The Lord of Heaven's armies will lash them with his whip as he did when Gideon triumphed over the Midianites at the Rock of Oreb, or when the Lord's staff was raised to draw the Egyptians' army in the sea. In that day, the Lord will end the bondage of his people. He will break the yoke of slavery and lift it from their shoulders. God told them, that these things were going to take place. God told them that these things were going to happen, but he also gave them hope in it because he says, he showed them that in times of trouble, it is, at, it is a test. And if you have just enough faith, that strong faith, you will get through the test. In spite of what it looks like, the very instrument that God uses to destroy their land, his land, his people, is the and punish them will be dealt with by God as well. What you thought would take you out will actually be taken out by God. God uses the most powerful tool. Remember, the Syrian army was a powerful tool. They were a powerful army. God, God used the most powerful tool, the most powerful army to try to destroy his people and take them out. But then God used that tool and taught it a lesson and destroyed the tool. This shows God's power. The Syrian army thought they were more powerful than God. They rejected him. Yeah, they kept winning all these battles. They destroyed a couple lands. Yeah. But once they touched God's people, God turned it back on them. There was a cleansing that needed to take place. There was a renewal that needed to take place, that needed to happen. Every God was going to end everything that was holding them down, that was oppressing them. God was going to push them back. Everything that was pushing them back, God was going to push back off of that, right? Verse 27, he said he would lift it from their shoulders, the very things that pushed them down. God says, I'm going to lift it from your shoulders. God is ready to do some lifting in your life. God is ready to do some heavy lifting in your life, all of those problems in your life, those trials and tribulations in your life. God is ready to do some heavy lifting in your life. Some of you lost jobs and God is ready to lift that burden off of your shoulders. Some of you have, have fell into deep depression and God is ready to lift that burden off your shoulders. Some of you are feeling sick. God is ready to lift that burden off your shoulder. Some of you are struggling financially and God is ready to lift that burden off of your shoulder. Some of you and your kids, your kids aren't acting right and God is ready to lift the burden off your shoulder. God is looking at your job and your work and he's saying he's ready to lift that burden off of your shoulder only if you just have strong faith and trust in God. This is what they needed to do. Isaiah describes in verse uh, 28 and 34, Isaiah described in 28 and 34, look, the Syrians are now at Aya. They are passing through Megan and are strong, storing their equipment at Michmash. They are crossing the pass and are camping at Geba. Fear strikes the town of Ramah. All the people of uh, Gibeah, the hometown of Saul, are running for their lives. Scream in terror, you people of Gilam. Shout out a warning of Lah Lahiyah. Oh, poor Anath. There go the people of Manmana, all fling. The citizens of Gabim are trying to hide. The enemy stops at Nah the rest of that day. He shakes his fist 
at beautiful Mount Zion, the mountain of Jerusalem. But look, the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies will chop down the mighty tree of Assyria with great power. He will cut down the proud. That lofty tree will be, be brought down. He will cut down the forest trees with an ax. Lebanon will fall at the almighty one. Isaiah describes the complete destruction of the Assyrians. The very thing that God will use to punish us will be the very thing that God uses to uplift us, to build character in us, to build change in us, to build faith in us, to build hope in our lives. Don't get discouraged from the test, but be encouraged by the test and know that God is with you. Establish that strong faith in your life. God is about to raise the problems from your life if you just hold on and remain faithful to him, folks. God will use the strongest and the toughest tool in the box, the strongest army in the box to show you a lesson. God used a car accident that should have taken me out when I should have been brain dead or dead to show me a lesson. Those very things in your life those very tools in your life that seem so tough, big and heavy and strong, supposed to take you out, God will use them to uplift you and build character in you, to make you strong, to make you whole. Strong faith, that's what it does, it builds character in us. Powerful stuff. Thank you for watching. Father God of grace, mercy, and love, we thank you, God, for this wonderful day. We thank you for this lesson, God. Keep us right now, oh God, where we feel weak. Build us up where we feel weak right now, oh God. Build strong characters among us right now. Those who are dealing with problems, let them know, God, that you are with them in it. If they stand firm and stand strong in faith, God, that you be with them. Have your way right now, oh God. We love you. We bless you. Watch over us, oh God, right now. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us November 4th as we start a new Bible study series that will tag off and lead us into 2021. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for 2020 to be over, and I'm super excited for 2021. So please join us November 4th, 7 p.m. Can't wait. God bless you.